picture John's letter like this. One of the things that I do when I discipline Piper is sometimes I spank her butt. Uh, other times, Piper's my daughter, not my wife, okay? So other times, yeah, that would be really weird. But uh, other times, um, I speak to her and I talk with her. And sometimes I do let her throw her temper tantrums because I know that she is just acting out. And there's really nothing I say or do that's going to help curtail this, okay? She just wants attention. But when I do spank Piper, I walk up to her, I give her a hug, and I tell her that Daddy loves her. But what she's doing, and I look at her, and I say, Piper... What you're doing is not okay. We don't behave like that. Not just you, but we. This isn't who we are, and this isn't how we live. And I hold her, and I hug her, and I let her know how much I love her, but I still discipline her. And that's what John is doing in 1 John chapter 2. He, as you know from last week, if you were here, he calls them um, my little children. It's a term of endearment. And John's coming up along these Christians through a letter form. He's putting his arm around them. And he's saying, look, church, this isn't what we do. This isn't how we live. This isn't who we are. And for those of us who are authentic Christians, we will believe certain things and we will obey in certain ways. Last week, if you remember, one of the marks of authentic Christianity are people who recognize and renounce their sin. They look at their sin, and even though they make mistakes and they fall short, they look at that and they say, that's not who I want to be. That's not what I want to do. That's not how I want to live. And John said in 1 John 1, verses 8 and 9, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and is just and will forgive us and purify us from all unrighteousness. So, A key element of authentic Christianity is somebody who recognizes and renounces their sin. Today, another key element of Christianity is somebody who obeys. An authentic marker is somebody who obeys. And so simply put, we can put it like this. Authentic Christians are those who live and love like Jesus. Authentic Christians are those who live and love like Jesus. Read with me 1 John chapter 1, or 1 John chapter 2, verse 3. John writes this. We know that we have come from him. We know that we know him. Know him who? We know that we know God. If what? If we keep his commands. You see, last week we talked about it. It's the same thing that's going on here. There's a group of people who proclaim to be Christians, and they are what's called Gnostics. They say, we know God, but by their actions, they actually deny him. So they talk a good game, but when it actually comes to following God's commands and recognizing their sin, they don't have any of that. In fact, they say, well, we have special knowledge. And because we have special knowledge, that means that physical sin is irrelevant. We actually don't even commit sins. We're sinless. We're perfect. We got the knowledge. You don't. So you need to become like us. And they have this problem. Not only uh, do they regard sin as unimportant, but now they're claiming we don't even need to obey God because we're, we're flawless. We're perfect. So they have these two major issues, and John writes to them. He says, look, authentic Christians don't just say, I believe God and I know him, but they actually obey his commands. And John is putting forth an argument here, and he's simply saying this. Christian behavior must be consistent with what God discloses towards us. So if Jesus revealed certain teachings, what will an authentic Christian do? Follow those teachings. If Jesus says this is a certain way that you should behave, what will an authentic Christian do? They will follow those certain behaviors. If Jesus says, look, there are certain beliefs that are essential to Christianity, what will an authentic Christian do? They will believe those doctrines. And so John really puts it pretty simply. This idea of being an authentic Christian, authentic Christians are very easily recognizable because they have certain marks, certain characteristics that dictate their attitude, their life, and their belief system. And so the Gnostics definitely had it wrong. What we do in the flesh, how we behave, really does matter because it determines whether or not our faith is authentic. Look what John says here in verse 3. First of all, he says, we know. We know. Isn't it nice to reach a point in your life where you're like, look, I know this. And he goes on to say, we can be sure. In this we know. He says it 25 times in this epistle. I mean, do you think John's trying to get a point across here? We know what it's like to be an authentic follower of God. How do we know that? Because he says, we obey his commands. Jesus had this kind of mentality when he taught through the Gospels. For instance, he says, you will know a tree, for those of you who might know this, you will know a tree by what? The fruit it produces, right? That's an illustration that he gives. He says a tree is easily recognizable by the fruit. 
He says a good tree produces good fruit, a bad tree produces bad fruit. Another example that he gives is he says, look, you're going to know what a person believes and how they live by the kind of foundation that their house is built upon. When the troubles of life come, if their house is built on a foundation of sand, they will crumble. If they are built on a foundation of the authority of God's word, they will stand strong. And so again, another illustration. If you look at the book of James, James uses this illustration that both salt water and fresh water can't flow from the same spring. How do you know whether or not you're following God? In other words, James says it's going to be dictated by the kind of language that you have. Are you derogatory? Do you slander? Do you accuse? Do you put people down? Are you mean-spirited with the kind of speech? Is it salt water or is it fresh water? So there are some clear-cut characteristics of what it's like to be an authentic Christian. And for John, here in this passage of Scripture, the mark of authentic Christianity is, again, somebody who recognizes and renounces their sin and somebody who keeps God's commands. Now, remember, the Gnostics, they sought a release from the ignorance of the world through their special knowledge. And John says, look, you actually don't have knowledge of God because, and here's a key phrase that I'd like to share with you, knowledge of God is not intellectual and speculative only, okay? It's not mysterious, Eastern mysticism isn't something that the Bible teaches. Knowledge of God is not just rational. It's experimental. It's dynamic. It's something that you experience. It's something that you do. Because God is not an abstract object. God is a concrete object. God and knowledge of him is not something that is abstract. It's historical. It's something that you can know. And that's how John starts off this epistle. His first four verses are, we know Jesus. We saw Jesus. We touched Jesus. We heard Jesus. I mean, we know that this guy was physically real, and we heard from him, and he really died on the cross for our sins. God is real. He's not abstract. And so when we think about this knowledge of God, we can simply say this, to know God and to have fellowship with him is not just having the right thought process, but a genuine spiritual relationship. God isn't just your God. The Bible says God is your Father. It's a relationship that we have. And so Paul, or John really wants us to understand this. The aim of our knowledge is not just to have knowledge. We're not learning. We don't come to Bible study and church just so that we can get more information in our brains. The reason why we want to know God is to experience him in a spiritual relationship. And so my question to you this morning is this. Why do you come to church? Why do you read your Bible? Why do you pray? Why do you have knowledge of God? Is it just to jam information in your brain? Is it just to check mark off on your list? Hey, I did this. I'm a good Christian. Or is it to say, God, I want to experience you in an intimate relationship, in a personal way? John says, we have come to know him. He uses the perfect tense here, which basically can be translated, we have known and we continue to know. We first knew God when we gave our lives to him, and that is an ongoing relationship that we have with him. How can we be sure that we know God? How can we be sure that we know God in the present, as John is is offering here? Simply put, if we keep his commands. And so here's a simple test for you this morning. Do you keep God's commands? When you read the Bible and you see certain things that you should do, whether it's treating your husband or your wife a certain way, whether it's leading, leading your household as a mother or a father, whether it's your Christian conduct and behavior in church or in the workplace. I mean, when you look at your life and you read God's word, what kind of pattern do you have? Look, John, we know this from last week. He's not talking about being sinless and being perf- uh, having a perfect life. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, what general pattern are you developing in your life? If somebody were to look at you and say, look, this is a pretty consistent person. Would that be on the side of sin or would that be on the side of God's commands? Now we all mess up. We all make mistakes. We always break away from that perfect life and we feel that, don't we? So here's another question. How do you feel when you break that pattern? Are you remorseful over it? Does it convict your heart? Does it hurt you? Are you sad towards God? Do you do what John said in 1 John 1? Confess your sins? Do you trust that God will forgive you? What is the pattern of your life? And look, I get it. 1 John 2 is not an easy chapter to read because it really confronts us. It's either A or B. It's either black or white. You either are or you're not. What is the manner of your life is what John is getting at. And so what is the extent of your moral obedience? 
Do you obey God's orders? Do you walk in obedience towards God? Simply put, do you have a habit of following God? Jesus told his disciples this in John 14, 15. If you love me, you will keep my commands. And so again, he's not talking about what it means to be perfect, as we demonstrated last week. He's talking about what it means to know God. So while obedience is not the condition for knowing God, it is the characteristic of knowing God. And again, he's talking to people who are Christians. And so, yes, God will forgive you. Yes, God will release your sins and let them go if you're willing to give them to him. But there is a characteristic of Christians. Christians are different because Christians follow God. And so what are God's commands? Well, simply, I think we can just open up our Bibles and we can read them. If you look at the moral law, which preceded the the Mosaic law, people who walked according to the moral law would be obeying God. If you were a good Jew, you would read the first five books of the Old Testament, Proverbs, Psalms, you'd listen to the prophets, and you would follow follow that. We as Christians, what do we look to for God's commands? Well, we look to the Bible. We look to the New Testament. We see the things that Jesus commanded and his apostles and his prophets, and we say, look, I'm going to follow that as best as I possibly can. The greatest commandment, Matthew twenty two thirty seven: 37, love God with all of your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Can you honestly say that you're following this command? And remember, love is not an emotion. It's not some mystical feeling that you have in your heart. It's an attitude. It's a way that you live. It's things that you intentionally decide to do. Paul reiterates this in Galatians chapter 5, verse 14. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. And so if you get worried about whether or not you followed enough, God, enough of God's rules or enough of God's commands, really you can simply step back and say this. Am I acting in godly love to the people around me? Am I acting in godly love to the one that I serve? It's a simple test, but yet it's a significant test. Let's, let's expound upon this idea a little bit further. There are three claims that John lays out that a Christian can make followed up by a test. I hated taking tests in school, all right? Give me a lot of anxiety. But at the end of the day, there are still tests of authentic Christianity. And remember, John is writing to a group of people. There were Jewish Christians, there were Gentile Christians, and then there were Gnostics who claimed to follow God, but they actually didn't. And so John says, look, I'm going to make this crystal clear for you. Let me give you three claims followed up by three tests. Let's look at the first one in verse 4. First claim, whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands, man, this is tough language, is a liar, and the truth is not in that person. So what's the claim? I know God. What's the test? But does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in that person. And so knowledge of God necessarily implies obeying his orders. To claim a relationship with God without the determination to obey them indicates a faith issue. It indicates an, authentic, uh, an authenticity issue. And so we, we may say this, well, look, I don't steal, right? I'm a good person. I don't murder. I don't lie. I don't go out of my way to hate people. I don't do really bad stuff. But does that mean that you know God? Does that mean that you have a relationship with God? There are two kinds of sins that we can, we can have. Sins of commission, co, to commit. There are things that we do that God directly says, hey, don't do that. And then we go out and do it. And then there are sins of omission, There are things that God says, hey, I want you to go do. And if we don't go do those things, we're falling short of the glory of God. And so when it comes to our obedience, it's not just just a list of things that I don't do. It's a list of things that I do pursue and I do follow and I do trust God on. And so don't think of this idea of Christianity and if I'm an authentic Christian, I'll follow a list of thou shall not. It's about following a person, Jesus. He says, go and do likewise. Stephen S. Smalley, in his commentary on 1 John, he says this, to assert that man is sinless makes God out to be a liar. We talked about that last week. But to profess a relationship to God without morality is to be a liar to one's self. It's pretty quiet in here. This is tough stuff, isn't it? I mean, John is laying down the law. Are you living an authentic life or are you not? And so don't be discouraged this morning. Don't leave here thinking, well, I just, I failed. Man, I've really got beat up this morning. Oh no, what the Christians in that day would have said is, wow, let me make sure that I'm in line here. Let me get encouragement, make sure that I am following what God wants me to do. Let me know that this is clear cut. And if I just make this small change, if I just start following him the way that he wants, 
And I confess my sin to him when I do make a mistake. If I make it a pattern to follow God, not even though I feel like it, even though maybe I'm a little confused or I have some doubts, but if I make a pattern to follow God and I trust him, I can be an authentic Christian. Thankfully, John reveals some really practical examples of what obeying God looks like. And I said it at the beginning, and I want to repeat it to you now. You will love like Jesus, and you will live like Jesus. Look what he says in verse 5. But whoever keeps his word, in him the love of God has been truly perfected. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. So notice how John widens his argument here. In verse 3, he talks about obeying God's commands. In verse 5, he talks about keeping God's word. Now here in verses 5 and 6, he's going to say the authentic Christian doesn't simply know God. But to him, God's love has reached fulfillment. How? He loves and he lives like Jesus. And so the person who obeys God's word is the person who is filled up with God's love. Remember, love is not an emotion. Love is is an action. Love is something that we do. It's not something that we don't do. You see, true love for God is expressed in our moral character. If we love God at all, we should want to obey him. We should want to love him. We should want to follow him. Why? Why we'll never reach perfection. It's all about the attitude of I'm going in this direction. It's not about reaching a destination and saying this is the way that I'm moving forward. It's like husbands and wives. Do you ever make mistakes in marriage? I would think so, right? You always make mistakes in marriage. But what direction are you heading? Are you just going to say, well, hey, look, I got the ring on my finger. I'm done. Destination reached. Absolutely not. That would be a big problem, right? So we can't approach Christianity as, well, finally, when I reach that point, oh, no. It's about what direction am I moving? When I do make a mistake, am I moving back towards God? When I do sin against somebody, am I moving towards them? When somebody comes to me with accusations of sin, am I willing to reconcile and meet in the middle? What direction am I heading? Look what John says here in verse 6. He's going to give us the second claim. The one who says, I abide in him, claim, ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked, test. How can we be sure that we abide in God? Well, simply put, we will live like Jesus. Our lifestyle, our attitude, the expression of our knowledge of God will say, look, I'm a Jesus follower. And so when you look at your life, don't look at the life of the person next to you. Don't think of so-and-so who doesn't look like this. Think about yourself. That's what I thought about when I was studying this sermon. I want to look inside, not outside. And I encourage you to do the same thing. What does your life say about your knowledge of God? Is the knowledge in your mind matching up with the walk in your lifestyle? Jesus told his disciples this in John 15, 5. I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me will do what? Bear much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. And so remember this tree analogy or this vine analogy. You will know a tree. You will know a vine by the kind of fruit that it bears. And so John makes this point emphatically clear to the Gnostics who, de who denied the deity of Jesus. Ultimate knowledge of God is disclosed through Jesus the Christ. And if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, if you're not living and loving like Jesus, the knowledge that you're claiming is not authentic knowledge. If you're not walking like Jesus, you're probably not walking with God. That's the point that John is making here. So the key understanding would simply be this. Those who claim that I follow God and you don't abide in him, you don't abide in God. And that's a pretty tough statement. So again, what pattern of behavior do you have? Peter put it like this. God called you to do good even if it means suffering. Just as Christ suffered for you. He is your example and you must follow in his steps. And so I want you to think about some moments in your life where you have really wanted to show the sins of your flesh. You've really wanted to just do your own thing. Think about those circumstances. Maybe somebody calls you out at work. Maybe you have a fight with your spouse. Maybe there's a conflict in the church. Maybe your family's torn apart. And you say, what would Jesus do in this situation? What would you do? Are they the same? Do they look the same? Do they act the same? When you read about these situations in the Bible, can you say, I'm following that pattern? I'm doing what that guy would have done? You see, Jesus had certain characteristics and certain marks that were always saturated with love. When you looked at the lifestyle of Jesus, he always had God's love in mind. 
For God so loved the world that he sent me to die for you. Let's go a little bit further. Look what John says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 7. Dear friends, this is another word, beloved. Can you see the affection that John has for this church? They are family. He's saying, look, brothers and sisters, I'm not writing to you a new command, but an old one, which you have heard since the beginning. This old command is the message that you have heard. You go back and read the book of Leviticus. You know what one of the most important commands that they had in the Old Testament was? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You read the book of Leviticus, a key foundational element of that is love. Love each other and love God. Well, let's look at the New Testament. Somebody walks up to Jesus and said, Jesus, what's the greatest command? And you know what Jesus had to say? The exact same thing. And so this isn't something that is just freshly new. The word that he uses here for new, it means to be, I'm not writing to you something totally and completely new. It's like iPhones. You guys remember when the first iPhone came out? Anybody? Yeah, or you living in a fog, you're like, look, I just have a flip phone. And there's some people in here that have flip phones. It's awesome. And I've really been tempted to go back to flip phones because like our phones can consume our lives. But when the first iPhone came out, that was totally new of a different kind. But then iPhone one, two, three, four. Now we're into letters, okay? You know you've made a lot of phones when you've reached the letter status. So it's not, it's not iPhone 9, it's now iPhone X, which is the, you know, numeral for 10, in case you didn't know that. I'm terrible with Roman numerals. Whenever I would study, like, the old books, because I used to, before computer software really came on the scene, we had to flip through, you know, Strong's and, and just different Old Testament books, and they had Roman numerals, and I was lost, dude. You'd be like, flip to page 344, and I'm like, I have no idea where it's at, because that was that bad. They don't teach Roman numerals in school, so you can't blame me, Okay. But here's, here's the deal, is that he's saying, look, I'm not giving you something totally new, all right? It's not something totally new. It's something that has carried along with us since the beginning, but it is new in a different way now in the church. Remember, John is setting out the conditions for Christian living. Authentic Christians will renounce sin, and they will obey. And moral obedience is the true test of spiritual character, and anybody who discounts the need for right moral conduct, cannot be trusted. This is what it means to live in the light. And so if you ever find yourself coming up with excuses for sin and certain kinds of immoral behavior, you might not be passing the test, according to John. You see, when you look to Jesus, what kind of lifestyle did he live? Self-sacrificing. It wasn't about him. It was about the people that were around him. It wasn't about his wants, his desires, his preferences. He didn't lay down the law and said, it's either my way or the highway. He said, look, I'm going to point to God and that's who I'm following. Let's make things God's way. And so here's the question. Are there things that bother you about your life, about your country, about your church family, about your relationship? How about we do this? Let's point to God's way. What would God have us do? If you have a decision that you need to make when you look at the Bible, what does the Bible teach us? What is the command that we are to follow here? Well, we were talking about love, and the Bible saturates this idea of love. For instance, Paul said it in Ephesians 5 too, walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. Are you sacrificing for the people around you? Are you drawing the line on your own preferences and your own wants? James, he said it in James 2.8, if, however, you are to fulfill the royal law according to Scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And you are doing well. Are you loving your neighbor as you love yourself? First Peter chapter 2, verse 17, the three of the most important apostles in the church. Peter says, love the brotherhood. And so this idea of love is not an emotional feeling. It's an attitude. It's a willful decision. I choose to treat you a certain way regardless of how I feel. Because when Jesus died on the cross for us, he chose to treat us a certain way regardless of how God felt about us and our sin. Romans chapter 5 verse 8 says, God demonstrated his love for us and that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. While we were his enemies, while we were at odds with God, he chose to pursue us in an act of love. Hebrews chapter 12 talks about discipline in the church and that an act of God's love, God disciplines those whom he loves. And so God has sacrificed himself for us. God is willing to discipline us because he loves us. God is willing to forgive us because he's filled with grace. God is willing to reconcile us even though we are the ones who wronged him. What kind of lifestyle of love are you living? Look what John goes on to say in verse eight. But then he goes, yet I am writing to you a new command. 
its truth is seen in him. In who? In Jesus. And in you. Because of the darkness which is passing and the true light is already shining. So in other words, he's saying, look, this is something that isn't new. It's not, it's not a totally different new idea, but it's repackaged in a new way. Now, loving your brother and your sister is about inclusiveness in the family. Now the expression of your love is pointing to the person of Jesus, self-sacrificial love. When Jesus came on the scene, he says, you have heard it said, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. But I say, pray for those who are your enemies. Bless them and do not curse. Jesus took this idea of what it meant to love your neighbors and he repackaged it in the cross. Self-sacrificial lifestyle. Loving each other from action, not just from word. And so John goes on to say in verse 9, anyone who claims to be in the light but hates a brother or sister is still in the dark. This word hate. Anyone who loves their brother or sister, verse 10, and lives in the light, and there is nothing in them that causes them to stumble. But anyone who hates a brother or sister is in darkness and walks around in darkness. They do not know where they are going because the darkness has blinded them. Man, the damaging effects of hate totally blind you from seeing reality. You can't see it. It's impossible. You make judgments, You see things, you hear things, you interpret things in certain ways because your heart is so filled with hate that you're not walking in the light, Gnostics. You're walking in darkness. And I think about myself in that instance. And I I, I ask myself this question, well, what does it mean to hate somebody? What does it mean to walk in love versus walking in hate? And really, John, I'm gonna end with three questions that I think we can ask ourselves. The first one is presented right here in John. Are you hating people or are you helping people? He says, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. You're a murderer, he goes on to say. We're going to read that here in a few minutes. And you know that no murderer has eternal life inviting in him. I mean, think about that. Hatred is placed in the same moral category as murder, to take somebody's life without warrant. That's pretty strong language. Hatred is is this poison. It produces bitterness in your life. It eats away at your thoughts and your heart. It It deadens and destroys your soul. It blinds your eyes and stops your ears and hardens your heart and it fossilizes your rationality. To fossilize something, all you have to do is you get a lot, of wa- a lot of water, a lot of mud, and very short time. You can press it all together, boom, that animal is fossilized and it's not going anywhere. It is stuck in its perspective. And that's the same thing that hate does to our way of thinking. We're no longer rational. We no longer think through things. We merely respond through the lenses of our hate and it destroys our soul. You see, the world, believe it or not, and I know they don't like to say this, the world hates Christians and it hates authentic, true Christianity. It wants to destroy it. All you need to do is turn on your TV and you will see every major moral principle that the church stands for is being rebelled against and hated. I mean, holy cow, they will do anything to destroy a person or an idea. Why? Because they're walking in hate. They're not walking in love. And so if we get to the point in our culture and in our life where we look at God's word and we don't act it and we don't live it and we don't support it, we're probably dealing more with a hate issue than a faith issue. You see, when you hate your brother or sister in the Lord, you don't feel sympathy for them. You don't feel empathy for them. You don't know what it's like to be in their shoes. And so when you talk with them and you treat them certain ways, you treat them through the eyes of hate. Why? Because you're not loving them. And so here's what some people think. As long as I don't hate the person, right? I'm loving them. Oh, no, 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 no. Love is walking out action according to God's word. It's not just remaining absent from the picture. It's not saying, well, I just don't hate them, therefore I love them. Absolutely not. That's not what the Bible teaches. Love is an action that you do. What kind of actions do you do? Point to the Bible. What did Jesus do? How did he treat his enemies? How did he treat people he disagreed with? What did he do when the little children came up to him and the disciples tried to push, uh, push him away? And Jesus looks at the disciples, he says, suffer not these little ones from coming unto me, for of such are the kingdom of God. When it comes to the little children, what's your attitude and your approach towards them? When it comes to your enemies, do you pray for them? Do you bless them? Or do you make them your enemy and you hate them and you persecute them? What is it that you do when it comes to what Jesus did to the people around him? When it came to the entire world, Jesus says, look, I am dying to myself, and he meant that literally. When it comes to the people around you and your desires and your wants, are you living to yourself or are you dying to yourself? Are you following God and are you obeying his commands? 
This is tough stuff. There's no doubt about that. I'd like to read to you not 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And when I say not, I mean this isn't actually in the Bible. But if John were, or if Paul were to write the opposite, I think he would say a few things like this. Hatred is impatient and is harsh. It is a heated anger to take what others have. It brags about itself. It is arrogant. It acts indecent and it seeks the things of its own. It is easily provoked to anger and it keeps record of wrong. Hate delights in evil things, not truthful things. Hatred doesn't protect others. It doesn't believe others. It doesn't hope good things for others. Hatred quits rather than standing strong. And these are all the opposites of the word in 1 Corinthians 13. Are there any things that you look in that passage of scripture that you notice, hey man, maybe that's, that's, that's true of me and how I'm treating my children or my family, my spouse, my coworkers, my friends, my church family. What kind of characteristics do I develop here? You see, remember last week I said John writes in parallels. He deals with four different subjects of authentic Christianity and he repeats them. First John, chapters two through three, and then four and five. And he says this in First John chapter three. He says, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. And we know love by this, that he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. But whoever has the world's goods and sees a brother in need and closes his heart up against him, how does the love of God abide in that kind of person? Little children, let us not love with word or tongue, but in deed and in truth. And so the second question that I ask you this morning is this, are you self-serving or are you self-sacrificing? Are you hating or helping others? Are you self-serving or are you self-sacrificing? When it comes to the things of church or your life or in your family or at your job, are the decisions that are being made all about this is what I want, this is what I need, this is how I see things, or are you willing to give way? Are you willing to meet people in the middle? Do things have to be your way all the time? John says, how do we know what love looks like? Look what he says here. Jesus sacrificed himself for us. This is the identity of love. It is selfless. It serves a person who loves is more concerned about serving God and sacrificing others for others, not others. I'm going to sacrifice you. No, that's not it. <laughs> sacrificing for others than having its own way. And then thirdly and finally, it's simply this. The question, are you speaking or are you acting? He says this. When you see a brother or sister in need and you look at their needs and your heart is shut up to them, it literally means you make the willful decision to close up your heart towards them. How can the love of God be in a person like that? It's like when we look at the Samaritan women, for instance, and we see these women who are abused and manipulated. A lot of times sex trafficking starts, at least Calvin said last week, at the age of seven years old. That's really young. And we look at the Samaritan women and we see them in this great need and we literally shut up our hearts towards people like that. How can the love of God be in, be in somebody who looks at somebody like that and has experienced such terrible hurt and says, no, I refuse to help them? Or for instance, Arundel House of Hope, when we host winter relief people here, homeless people, and we say, no, nah, I just don't believe in that ministry. And we see these people who are homeless. A lot of them have mental disabilities. They've got the clothes on their back and a little suitcase. And we look at somebody like that and we say, no, I don't believe in that. It's not what I'm for. I'm going to shut my heart up towards that person. How can the love of God be in somebody like that? Or when we see our children or families that are in need, like for our Thanksgiving, and we see that people actually do have needs, and we say, oh, no, 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 I, you know, I'm not going to support that. I'm going to willfully shut my heart up towards that. How can the love of God be in a person? It's one thing to not be able to support everything. It's another thing to say, I refuse to support it because it's not what I want. When it comes to this idea of love, he says, let us not love with word or tongue. I believe God. I'm a Christian. I follow him. I do this. I believe all the essentials. Oh, no. It's not just about what we say. He says it's about what we do in deed and in truth. And so this is a tough sermon. If this is your first time here, <coughs> sorry. <laughs> if you've only been attending for a few weeks, I know that this was a tough one. But I want to urge you, if you want authentic Christianity, you can get it. And you can have it. And when you see it and you know it, man, you know it's real. Mm -hmm.